For those of you who are new to our church, we would like to invite you Wednesday night right across the hallway at 6 o'clock. I'll be meeting you if you would like to know more about our church, uh, what we believe, how you can be active, how you can get in a life group. Meet with us uh, at 6 o'clock on Wednesday. Use the little tear-off on your connection card. Write it and let us know that you're coming. We'd love for you to be there. Uh, Happy Mother's Day, everyone. What a wonderful Mother's Day. Thank you, choir. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The next day there was a wedding celebration in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the celebration. The wine supply ran out during the festivities, so Jesus' mother told him to have no more wine. Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. (laughs) How's that working for you, Jesus? (laughs) My time has not yet come. But his mother totally ignored him and said, Do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each could hold 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants followed his instructions. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, Though, of course, the servants knew, he called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first, he said. Then everyone has a lot to drink. He brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign at Cain and Galilee was the first time, was the first time Jesus revealed his glory. And his disciples believed him, him. After the wedding, he went to Capernaum for a few days with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples. Now, when you read a story like this and you, you hear the way that Jesus spoke to his mother, you wonder, what was he thinking? I mean, who would talk to their mother that way? I mean, who would use that tone of voice? I mean, Jesus essentially looks at his mother. His mother says, we have a problem. And then Jesus says to his mother, woman. Who do you think you are talking to me that way? I mean, like on my ordination day, saying to my mom, Mom, from now on you'll call me Reverend, please. (laughs) It's not going to work. I mean, in the NLT that I just read, it says, Dear woman, but the NLT is just trying to clean up this lapse of judgment on Jesus' part, because it's an incredible lapse of judgment. Now, what we don't see in the story is we don't see what Mary said. I mean, what did she say to him when he spoke to her that way? Or did she just give him mom eyes, you know? Mom eyes. You know what mom eyes are like? They can get you to do anything when mom looks at you a certain way. But we can read between the lines and know that maybe Mary said something like this. Don't use that tone of voice with me, young man. (laughs) You may be the son of God, but I'll always be your mother. (laughs) What I love about this story is What I love about this story is we don't know exactly what happened. She completely ignored him. Do whatever he tells you. And he just did what his mother said. So if you don't remember anything on this Mother's Day from this message, just remember this universal truth, true across decades and generations from all cultures. The universal truth is you should always listen to your mother, right? It's true. 
What I love about this story is, and actually I've never used this story on Mother's Day before. It's a perfect story. What I love about the story is it just shows Jesus being a part of everyday life. Jesus had a mother. He had brothers and sisters. He had a family. He got in trouble with his mother. Jesus had drama in his family, and Jesus loved going to weddings. You wonder, why did Jesus go to a wedding? Well, maybe, he just actually, maybe Jesus actually liked people. <laughs> Jesus probably wanted to go to the wedding, drink wine, celebrate with the family. He enjoyed them, loved people, loved life. He was full of life. Probably even wanted to dance with the bride. I love that about Jesus because if you think that Jesus can't connect with your everyday life, you haven't read the story because he understands us. He, he really gets us. Turn to someone beside you now and say, he understands us. And you know what? Because he understands us, he makes life better. He's at a wedding and he makes a, a wedding better. So, so let me ask you this question. In terms of your own life, what makes life better? Now, if you ask the average person, you were to conduct a poll, I imagine they would say things like this. Life is better when we have healthy and meaningful and happy families. Life is better when we have good friends to do life with. Life is better when we have a job that we enjoy and that gives us purpose and meaning and we like the per people that we work with. A life is better when we have great experiences together that we can remember and look at the pictures. And life is better, you know, when we have a sense of purpose about life, when we feel like our life matters. I mean, everybody, right, wants their life to matter. And life is better when we have some sort of faith, something that connects us to something bigger than ourselves. Are you familiar with Bonnie Ware? Bonnie Ware wrote a book called The Five Regrets of the Dying. She was a hospice nurse. For more than 12 years, she met with dying people and asked them a question, do you have any regrets? She said whenever she would ask that question, there were five common things that continued to show up and up again. The first was, I wish I had the courage to live my life, a true to myself, not the life that others expected of me. She said, some said, I wish I had not worked so hard I wish I had the courage to express my feelings. I wish I'd stayed in touch with my friends. I wish I'd let myself be happier. I mean, what makes life better for you? Uh, for instance, if you were to go to Google today, and Google knows everything, the answer is to life, right? Google what makes life better, and you'll hear from the Mayo Clinic, the first one. And the Mayo Clinic wants to give you a list of things you can do to have a healthier life to make a happier life. All good stuff. Psychology Today will give you a whole bunch of ways to deal with the negativity and to create a healthy mind for a healthy life. Forbes magazine even can tell you what to do to have a better life. Forbes magazine is a business book, and they said, I read and I wrote it down, it said, if you want to have a better life, you need to stay focused, avoid distractions, and you need to face your fear. Don't worry about failure and commit yourself to something that's good. Now, there was a book you were going to give to someone. Uh, for instance, Ryan Holiday. If you're familiar with the book, The Obstacle is the Way, great book. The Obstacle is the Way, written by a young man named Ryan Holiday. Great book to give to a graduating senior. I think every young man and every woman, underline this, should read this book. It's written from the point of view of the philosophy of Stoicism. Stoicism was around long before Jesus. This is one of the things he says in the book. He says, you'll come across obstacles in life that are fair and unfair. And you'll discover time and again that what matters most is not what these obstacles are, but how you see them. It's all in how we think about them, how we react to them, and whether we keep our composure. That's stoicism. You'll learn that this reaction determines how successful you'll be in overcoming them or possibly thriving 
because of them, because the obstacle, according to today, becomes the way. Now, all these philosophies are helpful. You know, science and health and, and stoicism and Forbes magazine. All these things are super helpful, and if you apply them to your life, your life will be better. But i got to tell you something. I'm not a life coach. And I'm not a therapist. And I'm not a teacher. And I'm not, you know, a motivational speaker. I'm a gospel preacher. And because I'm a gospel preacher, I'm not discounting, I have a bias. And I want to be very clear about my bias. I believe that one thing above everything that will make your life better is Jesus Christ. His teaching, His way, the way He lived, the way He loved. That if you apply His teachings to your life, if you let Him in your life, your life will be better. My mom and dad were very poor. My dad grew up with nothing in an unstable family. My mom and dad, when they got married, my mom was 16, my dad was 17. I was born when my dad was 18. They had nothing. But they wanted to give us a better life than the life that they had. And for them, it meant this. It meant a stable home, loving parents that stayed married. Uh, they wanted to give us, uh, you know, a good way to live, all the stuff we needed for life, and they wanted to give us an education. A my dad wanted me to go to college, and I'm the first college graduate in my family. But they gave us one thing above all those things that made my life considerably better. Faith. They gave our, my sister and I, faith, a relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what I believe to be true. I believe with all I am and everything I am. It, this one thing has been true in my life, that if you will follow Jesus, your life will be better, and you will be better at life. And that's what John says. You see, John's a gospel writer. Add his voice to all the voices in your life that talk about what makes life better. At the end of his gospel, this is what he says. He gives the purpose statement in the very last chapter. He says, I could have written down a whole bunch of things about Jesus. There were so many things that he said and did that I didn't write down. But the ones that I did write down, I wrote them down because I wanted you to believe in him as the Son of God and the Messiah because when you do, you will find life in his name. Because in the middle of the gospel, in John chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says this, I came to bring life and to bring it to you abundantly. So that's why this story of the water and the wine is so significant. John says it's the very first miracle that Jesus performed that revealed who he was, that revealed his character. Now that's strange because you would think, okay, he goes to a wedding, turns water into wine, uh, is that a big miracle? It's not like raising the dead or driving a demon out or, you know, giving sight to the blind or healing the sick or curing leprosy. You know, it's just water and the wine. You know, it's sort of a little parlor trick. But you've got to remember something. In John's gospel, there's always two levels going on all at the same time. There's just the basic story. Yeah, Jesus saved a groom from an embarrassing social situation. But then there's the deeper meaning. Oh, that line, that line, it says everything. It says there, they ran out of wine. Because that's life. Because in the Bible, wine represents life and abundance and celebration and joy. And what happens? In life, we just run out of wine. You know, if you've been married a long time, you know what I'm talking about, right? You're out of wine. You know, you get married, you have a big wedding, and there's wine and celebration and fun, and you're surrounded by friends and family. You go on the honeymoon, and everything's happily ever after. Then you have a couple of beautiful children, and then you have ear infections and doctor bills and dirty diapers, and you don't get any sleep. 
And then as your kids are getting bigger, your jobs are becoming more demanding. You got mortgages and bills and college education to worry about. One minute your kids are crying because they're hungry. The next minute they're complaining because you didn't buy them the right basketball shoes. And then one day you look at each other and it's not that you intend this to happen, but slowly over time it just kind of happens, you know. You love each other, but you look back at the wedding picture and you wonder, where did that young couple go? And you say to yourself, where's the wine? Or maybe, you know, you went to engineering school just to pick a, a career. You went to engineering school and you just took it all in and you got this job at an engineering firm after you graduated. Great job and you love the people you're working with and you were so curious about everything. And in the early days, it was just like learning was like drinking from a fire hydrant. And they gave you more and more responsibility. And then one day, you're in your mid-40s, approaching 50, and you're looking at some schematics of our projects due. And you're looking out the wonder, window wondering, where's the wine? Maybe you're one of those people who just radiated life, you know, radiated life, and you sparkle with energy and passion, and people could look in you and could just see the light in your eyes, but they don't see it anymore because the wine is gone. Oh, what a great metaphor for faith. It happens. We, we have this connection with God, and we wake up, and we begin the day, and we have this sense of God all around us and this sense of connection and in our faith. But then over time, it just kind of drips away, and then one day we wake up and the wine is gone. And then Jesus answers the problem, according to John. Because what happens in the story, they invite him to the party, and they invite him to the party, and the miracle here is that Jesus brings the wine. He brings the wine to the marriage. He brings the wine to the work. Because wine, the miracle of the wine, the turning of the water and the wine, he made 180 gallons of wine. And the best wine. It's about abundance and extravagance and transformation and new possibilities that where there is no hope, there is hope. Where there is no way, there is a way. He's saying that when I enter into your life and enter into your situation, enter into your family, I bring abundance in life. You see, the gospel is not self-fulfillment. The world says, go find yourself. But the gospel tells that when you go look for yourself, you won't find what you're looking for. Because in the gospel, there is no self-fulfillment. The only path to fulfillment is something beyond ourselves. Because the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is abundant life. In Jesus Christ. And so look at the couple. They invite Jesus to their wedding and he makes wine. Invite him to every part of your life, invite him to your marriage. Because if it's important to you, it's important to Jesus. Invite him to your work. Invite him to your parenting. If you're a basketball coach or a little league coach, invite him to your sports activities with your kids. Wherever you are, whatever you do, invite him to your grief. Invite him to your loss. Invite him to your anxiety. Invite him to your work. Invite him to every part of your life because he doesn't want to live in a building somewhere behind stained glass. He wants to do life with you because he's not a dead figure in a book. He's a risen, resurrected Lord who lives in us and through us and brings life to us because he is the winemaker. He'll bring wine to your marriage, to your work, to your life and give you purpose. He's the purpose giver. Now, David, someone said from the back, I heard, they whispered to their wife, That's nice, but I've been married a long time. Make it real. Okay, here we go. Application. What does it mean to invite Jesus into your marriage, for one example? It means praying for your spouse. It means 
being vulnerable enough to pray together. It means practicing gratitude. Instead of being grumpy about what's wrong, ask Christ in your marriage to help you be thankful for what is good. It's inviting Christ into your marriage to strengthen you from temptation. It's inviting Christ into your marriage to help you be better parents. It's inviting Christ into your marriage to soften your heart so that you don't just dig in your heels and walk around mad and you can forgive. Christ becomes a part of our marriage when we begin to love the person in our life in the way that God loves them. It means having a shared history. If there's one thing I see with married couples and why married couples end up getting divorced, if I could just be really direct here, it's because they don't share a vision of what a better life looks like. Most people get married, they go on and do life, and they never ask the question, what does a better life look like for us? And so they're operating on competing expectations. And then one day they realize they're not living a shared vision for their life. So let me give you a recommendation. So what you should do is you should drop your kids off at my house for a couple hours. I'll give them power tools. No, seriously, drop your kids off at my house or Sue's house. And then go out and get a glass of wine and talk about what makes life better for us. Talk about what would life look like if it was better for us and talk about what it would mean for us to invite Christ into our marriage and have a real, real conversation. Now, I was telling Teresa this story and we were talking about this and so I got permission to tell you this story. I have an amazing wife. She's an amazing mother. She's made her house into a home and I would be an unwashed heathen if I had not married Teresa Emery. Uh, God blessed me with someone whose feet is on the ground, whose feet is firmly planted on the ground because I live most of my life with my head up in the clouds. And so she's this amazing person. And of all things, one day I said, God's calling us to Oklahoma. And she went with me. So she loves our church. She loves what we're doing. And, and she's excited. We're having so much fun together here. We love Tulsa. But I sometimes, I sometimes forget that she married me and not a church. And sometimes I get out of balance. Sometimes I forget to tell her where we're, you know, I say, this is where we're going without asking her, well, where do you want to go? And I, and marriages have up and downs and we all do too. And so the other day I came home and I was so excited. This is what's happening to the church and you won't believe this. And so-and-so said this, and this is going on and on. And I'm, you know, six donuts and five cups of coffees and 10 conversations. Woohoo! You know, I'm walking in the house. And she looks at me and she says, that's nice. Can you help me get the mulch out of the car? (laughs) And what what she means is, she goes, she's been living with me a long time. And I just forget that we're doing this life together. And sometimes she keeps me humble and keeps my feet on the ground and reminds me that we're in this together and that all the things that I'm talking about there are things that we all have to do. Now, now what I said, that was just one example. Uh, what I'm talking about applies to older people, younger people, children, youth. If you invite Christ to your life, following Jesus with your life will make your life better. It will make your family better. It will make the world. It will not make it easier, but it will make it better. And this is what Jesus t- says. He says that there is a thief or a wolf that is, lives in the world that wants to tell you what will make life better, but he says you need to be able to distinguish that voice from my voice because the thief and the wolf will come to steal and destroy and to take your life away. But he said, listen to me. Learn my voice because I came to bring abundant life to you. Because Jesus, well... He's the winemaker. He's abundance, forgiveness, 
grace, mercy, extravagance, new possibilities. And every day that you have air in your lungs, he brings wine. Every day that you walk this earth, he brings bread. He is the foundation of all life and of all our living. He is the way to life and truth. Will you come to him? Will you invite him in? He brings us wine, representing his blood. He brings us bread, broken for us, his body. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to this table to partake in the sacred meal of bread and cup. May these symbols remind us of all Christ has said and done for us, especially for his gift of eternal life. Fill our hearts with the spirit of your son so that our words can speak of your love to a world that needs to hear it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.